it's truly an ungrateful task for a scientist to provide a scientific evidence that we may be bunk bankrupting nature. It's a truly ungrateful task to provide the evidence that, yes, subprime loans knocked Lehman Brothers and knocked the world into a financial crisis, but we have the scientific evidence that we're actually operating the planet as a subprime loan. We're starting to hit the ceiling of the ecological capacity of planet Earth to support the modern world as we know it. This is an ungrateful message, because as we all know, when we celebrated Martin Luther King last week, he didn't say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. But I would argue that if it hadn't been that he was, in fact, in a nightmare condition, he would never have been able to articulate the dream. So I will now try to give you the diagnostics of the nightmare as a basis for the dream. And something that I try to do when I give this lecture is to listen to the CEO of Nestlé, who told me once after this lecture, exactly roughly laying out the science, that, Johan, don't worry, my definition of a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. So let's go. Now, we all know that we have this wonderful planet, Mother Earth, which provides all the basis for human well-being. In fact, this is the basis for all consumption, all production, the economy as we know it. What we often forget is that the equilibrium, the resilience of the planet, has gone in and out over millennia, over billions of years. But over the past 10,000 years, we've had a unique equilibrium that we learned in school to call the Holocene. The Holocene is absolutely unique. Temperatures are as stable as ever, plus minus one degree Celsius. In fact, everything we love about nature settles in during the Holocene. The archipelago just outside the windows right here in Sweden, or the rainforest, the wetlands, the polar regions, everything settles in and establishes themselves as a natural capital providing the basis for our economy. This is the Holocene. Today, we have the evidence that we are living in a crowded planet, we're seven billion people, committed to nine billion people, and rushing in a direction where we have become a force of change at the planetary scale. But I would really like to emphasize the following. We might just have reached the first course. We're not even in the main course in terms of human risks. Why is that so? Well, because, remind ourselves, that the global environmental risks so far have largely been caused by the rich minority on planet Earth. The 1 to 1.5 billion people that stepped onto the Industrial Revolution some 150 years back. It's now that we start seeing the big social momentum of a world going from have and have-nots to a world of have and have-plenties. This is a positive momentum, but we'll soon have a world not only of 9 billion people, but a world with 4, 5, 6 billion people with an average purchasing power of an average European, all aspiring to a lifestyle which caused the environmental damage in the first place. The other part of the first course is that planet Earth has had this tremendous resilience to buffer disturbance so far. Half of our emission of greenhouse gases are taken up by nature. A tremendous ability of absorbing heat in the deep ocean. Mother Earth has been our best friend. It is now for the first time we start seeing invoices being sent back into the economy due to high frequency of shocks such as heat waves, floods, droughts, and a tendency for the first time that Mother Earth might be going from a buffer, being our friend, to a foe. Just one example, that Greenland is now melting so fast that just the color change from a white surface that reflects energy back to space can you believe it? It's a big cooling mirror. 95% of incoming heat goes back to space. In 2012, during two weeks, the entire Greenland ice sheet was melting for the first time in observed history. These two weeks, just the color change from an ice surface to a liquid surface meant an absorption of an incredible 300 exajoules of heat. This is more than the annual consumption of energy in the United States. So this is when Mother Earth starts kicking in her feedbacks. So this is the situation we are in right now. We welcome humanity to the Anthropocene, a new geological era where humanity is at the driving seat of change at the planetary scale. This is not a normative stance. This is not a value-based judgment. It's simply fact. We are in the driving seat. So now we need to become, and I should just emphasize that even business today recognizes and welcomes humanity to the Anthropocene. So we must recognize 
that we all walk this planetary journey together. We've now reached the global phase of development. We simply need to recognize that all nations in the world need to collectively act in a new direction. And this picture here is taken from the Panema Beach in Rio de Janeiro. And the drama is that just 200 meters behind, it looks like this. And it's a reminder of the divisions in the world. So it's not only about walking a transformation together, it's about recognizing that in a world where we're now starting to reach a saturation point, we need to share the remaining ecological space on Earth. Nobody has done that before. How do you do that? How do you do an equity-based sharing of the remaining atmospheric space, the remaining biodiversity, the remaining nitrogen and phosphorus? The drama is also to recognize that the beauty is being rapidly deteriorated. You might think that I've downloaded this picture from the Lord of the Rings. You're just waiting for the orcs to run across this mortar landscape. In fact, this is Matthias Klum's picture from Borneo, where 75% of the rainforest is gone. And we're learning that this is not only an issue for biodiversity, it's an issue because it might collapse the South Asian monsoon, hitting back on the world economy. And we learn for rainforests that they can tip over much, much earlier to savannas when they lose resilience. We know that marine systems have already tipped to a large extent, from hard coral systems, rich in biodiversity, delivering to the economy, flipping over to algae-dominated soft coral systems that no longer neither can buffer carbon, but also do not deliver to the economy. The Baltic Sea, dependent on high predators like the sea eagles and the cod, tipping over to the algal bloom, frequently stuck state we are used to today. So resilience matters. Systems can flip early because of tipping points, and we need to understand the integrated system interactions between biodiversity and the climate system. Is, is this already hitting back? Are we bankrupting nature already today? Well, look at the facts. This is Hurricane Sandy that veers in and puts even the financial sector and Wall Street three meters underwater. Quite symbolic, isn't it, that the financial sector gets reminded of the global environmental risks that are now occurring at 0.8 degrees warming. We have the tremendous costs if methane continues to be released from thawing permafrost. A 60 trillion US dollar price tag if this tipping point would be allowed to occur. The Arab Spring, which of course was a dynamic revolution from socially connected, educated and engaged youth under dictatorial suppression. But also phosphorus prices increasing, oil prices increasing and a shutdown of large parts of export of food from Russia and Australia due to droughts and forest fires. 12 years of drought in Australia hitting the federal budget. Evidence that Mother Earth is sending invoices back. And also humbly recognizing that nature matters. Just look at this value of pollination in trillions of dollars just to sustain food systems thanks to the pollinating effect and even times reminding us that without pollinators, modern agriculture will collapse. We had a diplomatic crisis two years back when the UK sent clandestine scientists over to Sweden to snatch bumblebee queens because the pollinators had disappeared from UK agriculture. It became a diplomatic crisis between the two nations, sorted out in the end in a diplomatic way, but it's a reminder. So we also need to recognize that it's all about prospering now where we need to maintain the remaining big biomes from rainforests, wetlands, oceans, the polar regions, to be able to sustain the desired state of planet Earth to support humanity, the Holocene. Therefore, science has developed what we've called the planetary boundary framework. It is an effort of simply answering the question that if we are now in the Anthropocene, if we are now a geological force of change, but we need to maintain the Holocene to support 9 billion people in a prosperous way, what is the safe operating space within which we can have human well-being? And what are the big processes that regulate the stability on Earth? And the nine boundaries include, not surprisingly, climate change. And what happens when you put a boundary on climate change is that it translates into a finite carbon budget, a remaining amount of carbon that we can emit into the atmosphere without avoiding tipping points and disastrous or dangerous climate change. Now, estimates show that the remaining budget is not more than something like 600 billion tons of carbon dioxide. We know that just India and China will require roughly half of that to allow a minimum of economic development. So this shows the way we need to now start sharing a remaining finite budget of carbon. The same applies for phosphorus, which we consider to be a planetary boundary because it can have tremendous effects on tipping points in the ocean.
and tipping points in lake systems. So we have to share a remaining amount of phosphorus. Same for nitrogen. Biodiversity, we estimate that we've already come to a danger zone with biodiversity because when you lose more biodiversity, you risk tipping points in ecosystems from marine and terrestrial ecosystems, collapse of coral reef systems, collapse of lake systems, for example. But also remember that biodiversity is the genetic treasure that can generate new innovations for economic growth in the future. In area after area, we now have scientific evidence that we need things to add up at the global scale. We cannot allow ourselves to transform all land into agriculture and urban areas because natural ecosystems have functions that establish the resilience of our societies. We believe, in fact, that we can no longer lose any more biodiversity because it's becoming too risky. In fact, we have to maintain the three remaining rainforest areas just because they regulate the global hydrological cycle, they are the treasures of biodiversity, and they regulate climate. These are fundamental insights that we are living in, not only in a, in a hyper-connected world, we're living in a fully interdependent world. So for a finance minister in Sweden or in Germany, it is of equal importance to deal with your own domestic, national, capital, humans, natural and financial capital, as it is to sustain the rainforests in Borneo, because they regulate the stability of the world economy. This is a completely new insight and a completely new situation, this global interdependence. Now, the planetary boundary framework is today increasingly used to try and guide humanity in the Anthropocene. Even the United Nations is considering of now defining global sustainable development goals, which focus, of course, on poverty eradication, of course, on human well-being, but certainly also to define global sustainability criteria, such as planetary boundaries, within which we can have a prosperous future. It builds on 30 years of Earth system science that we do have limits, biophysical limits, that we need to respect, not because humans are bad, not because we need to protect nature, but for the world to have a chance to develop in a positive way in the future. So what does all this mean then? Well, it means that it's time to reconnect humanity to the biosphere. This sounds, of course, obvious. It sounds simple. But just think of it for a while. We built up a world where the economy is kind of the front engine, and then we do our best to reduce environmental impacts. Now science indicates that we need to reverse this order. We need to have the biosphere as the basis within which the economy can thrive. Science is increasingly showing a lot of evidence that this is what the world actually needs. It's not a new idea, in fact. It's been on the table for a long time, but it's only in the last 10, 15 years we have all the evidence that now is the time to act. And in fact, we have an urgent situation to act. We have recently suggested a framework for this of how to take the planetary boundary framework and connect it with an economic, social endeavor of both eradicating poverty, securing food security, and allowing for a collaborative effort of world development. We've called this a unified framework for sustainable development in the world. And this is just one example that you see here. Basically, you could say, what are the big goals that humanity universally want to achieve? Well, clearly, food for all, energy for all, water for all, good livelihoods, good governance. And what we're suggesting then is that for each of these goals, let's take water as an example, that you simply need to start by setting what is the sustainable maximum threshold for managing everything that matters for water. So we cannot push the climate system too far. We cannot cut too much forest because it changes water flows. In fact, President Lula da Silva at the time in Brazil, he never supported the climate negotiation efforts of avoiding cutting down rainforests until the day he recognized that if you cut down the Amazon rainforest, water supply to Sao Paulo would be jeopardized. He then stepped into that negotiation very actively. So setting those targets of non-negotiables, planetary must-haves, and then we can have social targets on water availability. We can use economic incentives and tools of how to then achieve a sustainable use of fresh water. And so we can do for the different boundaries. For climate, it would be quite simple, in fact. The world has agreed to a two-degree boundary, beyond which we are relatively certain of a very dangerous future for humanity. That translates to a carbon budget. That can then be distributed among the world's countries, and it can be translated to different kind of policy tools in terms of supporting an energy access for all. There's a lot of science to indicate that this would be the pressure also required for innovation and technological breakthroughs.
this, of course, needs to be taken down to the ground. And this is some work that we're doing in Ethiopia, just as a reminder that it's not about, you know, again, putting nature here and having humanity by the side. It's about being very smart stewards of every scale of nature. This is a picture of water harvesting to build resilience in small-scale rainfood agriculture in Ethiopia, just showing that in a world where we are having increasing turbulence in terms of water supply, droughts, floods, difficulties with deterioration of ecosystems, we need to be very smart in terms of using ingenuity in terms of building a sustainable future. We show, and many others have done so as well, that we can in fact feed humanity within a safe operating space, but it will require a revolution in how we produce food from the current unsustainable fossil fuel-based commercial agricultural systems to sustainable and much, much more effective systems, particularly dealing with land, water and nutrients. But it can be done. That's quite exciting. 60% of the world's cities have not been built yet. Can you imagine? Soon we have 75% of co-citizens of Earth living in cities. Cities will be the, the kind of deciding point in the world whether or not we'll be able to succeed in a transition to a sustainable future. Now, because of this enormous task ahead, it's, it's apart from being a challenge, an enormous opportunity. We believe there's a lot of science to suggest that we can build sustainable cities with throughput put and circulation of materials, of nutrients, fresh water, energy efficient solutions. We're not seeing that happening yet, but it's one of these enormous grand areas we need to focus on in a very, very prominent way. So how to round up this? Well, it comes back to uh, planet Earth and our small, beautiful marble of sustaining human population. We've lived for a long, long time and we still live in a world that basically operates under the big, big paradigm of having growth without limits. We can simply just bang on. GDP growth is necessary, it's a must, and off we go and we continue in that direction. For 30, 40 years, scientists have uh, perhaps a bit wrongly communicated limits to growth. There are limits that we need to be respectful of and therefore it's been interpreted as a limitation for growth. What I've been trying to communicate here is that there is a new paradigm. There's an opportunity to think of growth and prosperity within limits and that this would be a new paradigm where basically, just as illustrated on this stage, yes, there are boundaries that we have to respect and we cross those and we will have big risks that would hit back to the economy, bankrupting nature. But there's nothing hindering us to grow within the safe operating space and this is the enormous opportunity and the new page that many scientists in the world believe needs to be turned today. Thank you very much.